Hi guys, can you hear me okay? This is your president, Trisha talking. Thank you guys for showing up to our July virtual meeting. We have a neat show in store for you tonight. We are doing things a little bit differently because we are doing the mini programs first and then we'll be having our main speaker, Dr. Katie Mack, um, coming on at eight. But until then, let me tell you guys about what's coming up as far as CBIS events. The next big event is going to be a September 8th grand opening of the planetarium. The following week, we're going to have our next in-person meeting on September, uh, excuse me, Saturday, September 16th. So keep an eye out for more news about that. Also, we need to make a reminder or to let you guys know that we are still seeking results or seeking answers for our survey that we sent out. Everyone should have received the survey. If you haven't filled it out yet, please go ahead and take a couple minutes, fill it out. Let us know your ideas, suggestions, what you like, what you don't like, and we would really appreciate it. We are in talks with Geneva and we have renewed our agreement with them and we will be hopefully before too much longer getting some dates for our Geneva Dark Sky event. So again, just like the September events, keep an eye out in your email on Groups.io on our Facebook to learn more about that. And lastly, we have an event coming up this Saturday. For those that have are aware, we're doing our second astronomy workshop class at the planetarium. Derek had his first class, the beginner intro to astronomy class, last Saturday. We had a pretty good attendance, full house. So this coming Saturday, we're going to be having the intermediate portion of the class, so intermediate astronomy. And we are needing some telescopes. We're needing some volunteers. So if anybody is interested, contact myself, contact Derek, and um, we really appreciate it. With that, I'm going to hand it over to John Pinto. Or is John here, Frank, or is it just us? John is in the car. He got uh, delayed at work. So we're going to ah. mix up the order a little bit here. Um, okay. Excuse me. Getting over a cold here. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> one thing John wanted to talk to you guys about was the upcoming elections in our October meeting. And even though it's only July, it is time to start thinking about nominations for the 2024 board folks. So um, if you are interested in serving on the board, we would love to have you. Uh, we have some openings coming up. And let me just kind of walk you through what the different roles on the board are and how you can throw your hat in the ring for the October elections if you are so inclined. So let me uh, let me share my screen here and show you the website. That's probably the easiest way to do it. So if you scroll down to the website, you can see our beautiful smiling faces of the current board of directors. I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown of uh, who does what here. So you just heard from Trisha, our current president. Uh, both Trisha and I are talking about switching things up and taking on a different role within the board next year. So if there's anyone in the club who has past board experience on an astronomy club, or maybe you've been on the CFAS board before, that's a fair game. Probably not an appropriate role for somebody brand new to the board, obviously. Uh, but if you do want to throw your hat in for the elections for those roles, it's fair game. Same for treasurer. Uh, John Frank has uh, done a great job of stepping up to uh, fill in the interim role there for us, but we do need a permanent treasurer for next year as well. So if you uh, like finances and accounting, or even better, if you have an accounting background, we would love to hear from you. Uh, our secretary, Denise Woody, I believe last I heard is uh, running for a second for another term. So uh, that's cool, but we can always use help. And the other elected position that we have is for board member at large. So uh, John Pinto, who will be joining us shortly to uh, talk about his mini program, uh, this is his outgoing year, and the main function of the board member at large role is that on your way out, you have to run the elections for the upcoming year. So uh, John Pinto will be running the elections. And if you are interested in any of these positions, please contact John. You can reach him here at uh, bmal2 at cfast.org, or feel free to talk to any of, of us if you just have questions about what these different roles entail. Uh, but a board member at large is a great way to sort of get your foot in the door on the board and understand how it operates and uh, kind of learn what it's all about before you step up for uh, more responsibility potentially. In addition, we have a bunch of uh, appointed positions here for the various uh, program chairs. Uh, for example, Chris Hunt runs our loaner program chair. We're doing a great job there too. But for any of these uh, 
different uh, committees, uh, we can always use more help. It doesn't have to be one person. So if you want to help out, Chris, we'd love to hear from you. I'm currently filling in as webmaster, but if you have a passion for WordPress, please let me know. <laughs> I would love to hand that off to somebody else. Education chair, uh, social media publicity, might have someone for that. Stay tuned for details on that. Derek, of course, running our observing program. Douglas Woods running our outreach program. And uh, John Frank currently sitting in for a membership chair as well. Uh, we do need someone to fill that role as well. So again, any of these positions are fair game. If you want to toss your hat in the ring, the elected positions are president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and board member at large. Uh, but any of these other positions, we could use your help. You know, So like I said, uh, it doesn't have to be a one-person show. If you want to assist any of these folks uh, doing what they do, please let us know. I should also mention that the vice president role, that's me, uh, is also in charge of programs under, under the current rules. So um, that's why I'm talking to you right now. Uh, the vice president's role is to uh, book all the speakers and keep these meetings running, whereas the role of the president is more to just uh, preside over the meetings and preside over the board meetings as well. So again, if you're interested in running, the uh, elections will be in October. And uh, if you want to throw your hat in the ring, please contact John Pinto. Um, also coming up in October, we're going to be voting on a new set of revised bylaws for the club. So watch Groups IO for some details on that. Probably won't have that ready for your review for another month or so, but uh, we've been working very hard behind the scenes to try to update those rules that the club operates by and uh, the rules that govern the board of directors. They are, they're just out of date. You know, they go back to like the 80s and um, a lot has changed since then, both technologically and in how the club operates. So we're trying to uh, make things right and make sure the rules reflect how things work in 2023 and beyond. And with that, um, let's just jump right into the astrophotography showcase, shall we? Because uh, I think John's still on the road and uh, I don't see Barbara Harris on the attendees yet. So hopefully she will be joining us for the variable star of the month. If not, I'm gonna have some time to kill before our main speaker goes on. <laughs> uh, Dr. Katie Mack will be joining us at eight o'clock and uh, she is a renowned astrophysicist, cosmologist and author of this awesome book, The End of Everything, uh, which I'll talk about when I introduce her. Um, everything's been through her uh, assistant, though, and I always get nervous when there's third parties involved. So hopefully she got the uh, Zoom invite. Uh, but yeah, we're expecting her at seven. So let's just uh, jump right into the astrophotography showcase. I will uh, pull up the images here and share my screen. One moment while I push the magic buttons. All right. So as always, if you're here, I will hand over the virtual microphone and let you describe your images in your own words. However, Isabel Chauvetan, I believe, is currently on a plane flying back from here. Uh, she is coming back from a little vacation to the Chaco Canyon uh, out in New Mexico. And uh, this is just a iPhone shot that she took of the Milky Way. That's how dark it is out there. That's pretty awesome, right? So um, yeah, she's flying back from there right now. And Pretty amazing what you can do with an iPhone these days. And uh, it's that bright. It just point it at the sky and stand it there for 10 seconds. And there's the core of the Milky Way. That's pretty awesome. And if you've never been to, to New Mexico, it's a, a very fascinating place, not only for astronomy, but it's just a completely different culture. And, and you can't think of a more opposite to Florida, I think. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Some cool attractions out there, too, if you're uh, seeing the Oppenheimer film anytime soon. Uh, Los Alamos is a cool place to visit as well. This is also from Isabel, uh, from her 16-year-old daughter, who's currently in Namibia right now. And she writes that she's in Namibia with the National Geographic Society on a student wildlife conservation trip. During her three-week trip, she crossed the Namib Nakluft Desert, I hope I said that right, and was in one of the darkest sky places on Earth. She shot the Milky Way with her iPhone 13 with no processing. This is a single shot, 10-second long exposure. That's Again, pretty amazing what you can do with an iPhone under dark skies these days. And I think there's a second one there, too, from a different angle there. So uh, live from Namibia, that's the Milky Way from Africa. Pretty cool. Up next, we got uh, Mark Femininio. Hope I, 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 I hope I said your name right. Um, let me put you off a of mute here, Mark. I think I saw you online. Hi there. Yes, and you did a very admirable job with the name. Thank I you. tried. All right. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, um, it wasn't great seeing, it was pretty good, but you know, there, so it's, it's okay, but it, it can be sharper. Um, this was uh, Saturn a couple weeks ago, I think. Um, you can see the rings are, the tilt of the rings is noticeably closed up compared to last year. 
So this was with a homemade eight inch telescope and um, ASI 224MC a color camera. And I think it's probably a stack of 900 of 3000 frames. That's pretty darn good for an eight inch. Uh, that's, that's really good detail. It's uh, getting close to opposition time, isn't it? I think it's good around midnight right now, if I remember right. It's yeah. Around 4 AM it's at um, it's transiting. Cool. But yeah, it should be getting yeah, even four, better over the next month yeah. or two. So yeah. Time for me to drag out my planetary rig as well. Very cool. And uh, you've got a sunspot for us. Yeah, this is with the same scope. This is my first attempt at a, at a solar picture. So um, for a first attempt, I'm pretty happy with it. It's, uh, it's what is it, 33, 63, I think is the spot. The one that you can still see it now. It's, it's a pretty big spot. A um, little past center in the sun. Um, and this was a few days ago. And it... Uh, um, the biggest challenge is trying to focus looking at the monitor with in the daylight. So I put a towel over my head and over the mirror and, or I mean, over the um, monitor and uh, sitting there trying to focus was, I, mean, I was just streaming sweat. So it's, you know, we can have some pretty good skies here. And I would recommend earlier in the morning, of course, before the clouds kick in and the atmosphere gets too turbulent. Yeah. But, that's pretty, um, good. pretty good detail on here though. I was happy Absolutely. with it. Yeah. So tell me more about the rig here. Like um, I'm, I'm solar curious myself, but I, it's so confusing with all the hydrogen alpha scopes and thousand yeah, dollar filters. This is just like, a white light filter. This is a um, Bader filter um, you know, covering the front and then just that same 224 MC camera. So no other filter. Um, wow. And it's an eight inch homemade home ground mirror. So yeah, on a um, uh, Lowe's Mandy, GM8 mount. So that's just like a Mylar filter or something in the front? Yep. Like, yep. wow. All right. So, so obviously this is false color, right? Like you had to, uh, yeah, add... you know what? It's, it's odd that it colored this way. Cause normally it's like a lightish, like a whitish blue right. you, through that filter. So I was a little surprised. I didn't do any color changing. Huh. Uh, other pictures I tried were the, were bluish. I'm not quite sure how it came to this color to be quite honest with you. <laughs> It was, it, 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 yeah, it was a very happy accident because I've tried a different, a few other pictures or videos I took that same time and um, didn't have as much detail and they were all bluish white. Like I would, like it looked visually. Wow. So, but I like the color scheme. I mean, this is a lot nicer, more pleasant color, I thought, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. So, you know, using your existing planetary imaging gear, you can just get a relatively inexpensive filter for the front of the scope and uh, make images like this. I did not know that. Very cool. All right. Oh, it's mine. Um, so thanks, Mark. Uh, this is, uh, well, technically it's astronomy related because this is the launch of the Euclid Space Telescope uh, shot from my front yard from a handheld Canon EOS R7 with a telephoto lens. So uh, I didn't realize I could get shots that good just from my front yard, but there it is. And this is actually relevant to tonight because our main speaker is going to be talking about dark matter and dark energy. And uh, that is the purpose of the Euclid Space Telescope that's up in the fairing of that Falcon 9 spacecraft there. It's on its way to the L2 Lagrange point. So it'll be neighbors with the um, James Webb Space Telescope out there. Very cool. Uh, moving on. And this is my deep sky effort of the month. Um, obviously, we didn't have a whole lot of clear nights this month, but I did find a few hours. Uh, there was a bright moon, but there's a couple of things you can do when the moon's out. Uh, well, three things, really. You can shoot the moon itself. Um, you can shoot planets, or you can always shoot globular clusters because they're pretty bright, too. This is M14. Uh, I keep coming back to this one because its golden color kind of uh, fascinates me. It is possible to process these images such that it pulls out the blues and reds of the individual stars. But if you actually process this in a way that's true color, the way that it's actually seen to us, um, it's it's gold, which is kind of weird for a globular cluster. And I can't figure out why. Um, what research I've done on M14 shows me that there hasn't been a lot of research on M14. The reason that I saw it stated is because it has a pretty hefty redshift due to its motion. So it makes it difficult to uh, to study. But I also noticed that something unusual about M14 is that it's very close to the galactic plane. So typically globular clusters, one of the many ways in which they are weird 
is that they live in this uh, sort of sphere surrounding our galaxy. They're not necessarily in the plane of the galaxy itself. So some people think they're just clumps of matter that never really got sucked into the swirling disk of the Milky Way, and they've just been kind of left there since the galaxy formed. But I wonder if because it's actually that close to the plane of the, the galaxy that maybe this light is passing through more gas and dust on its way here. Maybe that's why it has this weird golden color. I don't know. I'm just guessing, but I would love to know for sure. So if there's any real astronomers in the group who know the answer, uh, please let me know. <laughs> Moving on, we got uh, Wes Clem. Let me, uh, I think this is yours. Let me unmute you. There you go. Yes, sir. How you doing? Hey, good. How are you? I'm all right. So yeah, this is a uh, M51. I finally got first light on my uh, Edge 8, you know, working through various issues, you know, going from 400 to 1422 is a challenge. Um, so this was done a couple weeks ago, around 90% moon. And uh, yeah, the, the detail that I was able to pull out on this, given all the issues that you know, I'm still facing, I'm just super excited that uh with the result that i came up with so when i finally like uh get everything completely resolved i'm just i'm really excited about what this scope was capable of absolutely that's great stuff uh, especially with a bright moon um and such a short relatively short total exposure time yeah Love the colors four, on that too. four hours and a bit yeah four and a half yeah. yeah i mean usually it takes quite a bit of time to tease out that uh wispy stuff at the end of um i forget what that that blob at the end is called like m51b or something but um, uh, yeah the NGC number, I don't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> NGC something, right? <laughs> cool. But yeah, that's awesome detail. Uh, you got to love these uh, face-on galaxies where you can just see their structure like that. And this one's even more fascinating because it has that little neighbor that it's uh, sucking in there or maybe it's passing through it. I'm not really sure what the the action is going on here. but Yeah, um, I've read conflicting things. They think that uh, it might have already collided and this right. like is like the the result of it or something like that like i'm not i'm not sure it's been a while since i read about it myself yep yep but it definitely sparks the imagination very cool stuff cool yeah that came out pretty good uh so thank you wes and hopefully we'll have some more clear skies uh for next time okay. oh that reminds me about, by the way guys there is no august meeting uh, we typically take august month because it's just hopeless when it comes to the weather for astronomy in that time of the year here and um uh, but we'll, we'll we'll be reconvening in september 16th i think it is um for an in-person meeting back at the planetarium so uh, mark the calendars for that i think i sent out the invites on groups io for that already and let's uh kick it off to richard wright let me unmute you i know you're in here there you are can you hear me yes all right so this is the sun um this was june 30th so it's not the current sunspot um as Mark mentioned, I uh, got up early, early in the morning. Yeah, about nine thirty or so, and shot this in the in front of my house. Um, this is also a white light image. Um, small rig, uh, astrophysics refractor, ninety two millimeters on a Skywatcher. It's a Star Star Adventure GTI, which is like a little tiny equatorial mount, and I used a Herschel wedge for the white light filter. So a Herschel wedge goes on the back of the telescope. And it lets most of the light through the through the mirror, so it goes out the back of the Herschel wedge, and then only reflects a portion of it up. So it's just like a regular wedge, uh, uh, like a reg regular star diagonal, uh, except it uh, it only reflects a little bit of the light. And then you can put a camera on there or look through it with an eyepiece, and it's safe. So I shot this three times. I shot once at the native focal length of the telescope. This is, by the way, is a um, Player One Apollo Max uh, monochrome camera, and I used a continuum filter, which is basically, it's just a very narrow green filter, and um, a lot of people don't know this, but the sun's spectrum actually peaks in green. Uh, that's the strongest, uh, strongest wavelength, and so you filter everything else but that green, and you just get a little extra contrast so you can see some of the little squiggly things on the surface there, and it helps bring out the sunspot uh, better. So this was the native focal length. And then the next photo is um, 2X. Uh, this was uh, astrophysics Barlow slash flattener. So this is at 2X, the resolution. Um, 
And then the final one is at three at uh, 4X with a 4X power mate, uh, got in even a little closer. It was really a huge sunspot group. I know a lot of people were posting on the Cephas forum. If you had solar glasses, you could actually go out and just look up at the sun with the solar glasses and you could see the little spot. Tiny. Right on the Tiny. sun. Uh -oh. I don't. Yep. That was... <laughs> okay. Sure it's unmuted there, but. Okay. Do you. Uh, I do have a picture of the solar of the setup. Do you want to see that? Yeah, I can make you a co-host temporarily if you just want to share your screen there. I'll just share my the one window to show you. I took a picture of it when I was taking a. Yeah, hang on a sec. I'll give you. I'll give you the power. You asked a minute ago for a picture, so it's like, oh, I've got a picture. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that actually. Like, I'm super curious about how that all works. Uh, promote to panelist. All right, you're now a panelist, so accept that, and then I can make you a co-host. And then I can stop sharing my screen. Oops, wrong button. All right, I think you have power now. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so walk us through what all this stuff is. Oh, Richard, I think you're muted. You are muted. How's this? There you go. All right, all right. too many buttons and they're never in the right place. Right. So <clears throat> this is a very small uh, regular mount and of course the standard uh, refractor you, that you would use to look at, you know, uh, nighttime objects. So the real magic is back here on the back. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the orange box is the Herschel wedge. And then there's a camera on the on the back. So the Herschel wedge is just like a regular star diagonal. <clears throat> and it's safe only up to a certain size. You wouldn't want to put one of these on an eight inch SCT, but a small refractor, you can put that on there. And um, most of the sunlight goes out the back. Um, and then just a little bit of it comes up. And there's also a neutral density filter in there, too, to help uh, cut down on it. Let me see if I can find the right buttons. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. That's my sharing first question. Like, and then isn't go it back. damaging to the optics to just plow the sun right through them? Like, <laughs> it, it depends. Um, it depends on the optics. Do you see? Do, do, do. I don't know if you see, oh, here we go. So now do you see like the white dot on the back of the Herschel wedge? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a little bit further back. This is like after the hurricane, there's the tree I lost from the hurricane. Oh. But there's, they've got like a big polysilicate thing on the back and the sun uh, hits that, it actually helps kind of work as a finder scope too. You can kind of look at it. And you're, you're all right to be concerned. Uh, that much concentrated sunlight is very dangerous um, to you and to your gear. Um, if you're pointed straight at the sun, you know, the front lens of the scope is transparent. So it's like the sun shining through a car window. The car window doesn't get that hot and shatter, you know, up at the front. Um, but you have, if you are not pointing straight at the sun, then you can have concentrated sunlight landing on your baffles or on the side of the telescope tube, and you can superheat part of it. So you do have to make sure that you're pointed right at the sun with one of these. The front white light filters that go on the front, those are much safer uh, for your equipment. Uh, but I think the, the, the Herschel wedge gives you a better view, both visually and uh, photographically than, than they do. Okay. Cool. Thank and you. it's just white light. It's not very expensive, not nearly what a hydrogen alpha telescope would cost. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for the, the newbies here, let me go back and share my screen here too. Hang on. So, yeah, that kind of a setup is good for <clears throat> viewing the surface of the sun and sunspots, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to view right. prominences, that's a whole different ballgame, right? Right, right. You need a HA filter for that. Right. Where did my window go? Hang on, hang on. It's hard to find, isn't it? It is. All right, we're back. <laughs> we did have a question from uh, Luke Corwin about your first solar shot. 
Uh, there's another dot there. So is that dot near the bottom another sunspot or is it an artifact? That's a sunspot. I yeah. take flats for my uh, solar shots too. So cool. all the dust bunnies get corrected out. Right. But that's, yes, that's another sunspot. Yeah, cool. And yeah, if you want to get into the world of hydrogen alpha filters, we're talking like many thousands of dollars and lots of choices there, right? Not that bad. Um, really? A friend of mine bought a 40 millimeter Lunt double stack, 1400 bucks. And it was one of the best full disc images of the sun I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, you know what? I should have... Uh, uh, I, I should have sent you that picture. I took that at the Grand Canyon too. Uh, that wasn't taken through my telescope. Let me see if I can find it real fast. Um, and like fourteen hundred dollars. Um, and that's that's pretty um, pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's not so bad. I keep seeing ads for like these crazy things that are like massive machines with uh, stuff I don't even understand. And I understand quite a bit about astrophotography, but. Man, that hydrogen alpha stuff is just uh, befuddling to me right now. Someday I'll tackle it. Here we go. Here's the Lunt double stack. I've got it. Now I just got to find the I'll other window. Relinquish the screen. And share the screen again. Share screen. There's the image. You see that? Yes. Okay. So um, that was through the Lunt. That's the fourteen hundred dollar HA scope, and the picture doesn't do it justice. It was just glowing, uh, amazing shot. Um, wow! Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty cool. I came real close to just buying one as soon as I got home, and before I talked myself out of it. But yeah, it's a. That's not bad. So uh, Lunt or a Daystar Quark is a good way to go. The Daystar Quark is a. Also goes in the back of the telescope like a solar wedge does. So, cool. yeah. Yeah. So you got like kind of the best of both worlds there. I'm seeing like surface mm -hmm. features as well as prominences. I, oh I yeah, yeah. Really the prominences really come out real well on this. Yeah. So, oh, cool. I learned something. Thank you. And uh, let me go back to sharing my screen. And we got one more from you here. Ah, uh, this is um. Deep sky image, uh, the Tulip Nebula, and this is in Cygnus. Cygnus is a narrow band Disneyland. Uh, this is all hydrogen gas uh, or hydrogen. Whenever they go hydrogen alpha, it's just hydrogen gas uh, glowing uh, in Cygnus. And the Tulip Nebula is the really bright area in the center there. Um, and I actually have some, uh, some oxygen and color data. I just haven't gotten around to processing it but i really love to the ha black and white so i just went ahead and sent that in uh to yeah. look at it's about three hours of data uh player one monochrome camera the poseidon m uh three nanometer chroma filters uh same telescope uh, uh astrophysics stowaway uh on a paramount mighty though um, taken from the grand canyon yeah that's the secret <laughs> <laughs> really, really dark skies. Yes, uh, yes, it helps. Yeah, even with narrow band, um, I've struggled with this one myself. It's a devilishly hard thing to process and get good data on from out here in the suburbs. So, yeah, yes. and this is actually a shockwave from a, a black hole just out of view. I think as well, right? Uh, yeah, somebody mentioned that on Facebook. I need to go back. This is cropped down a little bit. I think I have that shockwave. Um, but you know how it is, you get a picture of a bird and you just, you crop it, the frame, so it looks about right. So this is artistically cropped, you know, so the weight of the image is right and all that nonsense. Right. Uh, but I may have that shockwave, I'll have to go back and, and look. Very cool. Yep. We have a question from Wesley. Um, he says, through one of those solar filters, how long are the exposures? Oh, very, very small, milliseconds, milliseconds. So you take, uh, you take a few thousand, uh, exposures in a video file, and then you go back and software picks out the sharper frames. So, you know, when you look at the moon at a high resolution, it's wiggling around. We call that the seeing or the scintillation. And the same thing happens when you're looking at the sun. It, it, you can't get a, it, it's moving. So you can't take a long exposure because it's very bright. So you take a whole bunch of short ones and out of all of those exposures, it's still moving around, but there are moments where 
the sky is very, it holds very still just for a, a millisecond. And if you sample for 30 seconds or a minute, you can go back and you can find those very sharp frames. Um, the one through the LUNT was a single exposure. I didn't do any stacking or anything. Uh, the white light ones, I used auto stackers to um, pick out the, the, you know, the sharpest 100 or 200 and combine them. Uh, and then you go in and clean it up in Photoshop or, or whatever. Yep. Very cool. Very similar to uh, shooting, you know, the planets as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, lucky, Richard. Lucky imaging. Yep. And that's all the submissions for this month. I'll stop sharing. Um, yeah. So difficult time to be an astrophotographer right now, but um, I like the ingenuity of like focusing on the solar stuff because uh, the sun does peek through once in a while, at least here uh, with uh, all this uh, El Nino craziness going on. The weather's been a bit uh, uncooperative, shall we say, but Hey, we just got to make it through the summer folks. And again, we'll be reconvening in September uh, with all sorts of new activities and more Geneva dark sky events as well. Uh, while we're waiting, uh, John, I think you're still on the road, right? Uh, so if, if not, speak up, but I'll, I'll stall for a few minutes. Otherwise, um, uh, I'm I'm oh, you are? Yep. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I will give you co-host privileges and hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Frank. Right, thank you. All right. Come on. So up next, we got John Pinto, our outgoing board member at large. And again, if you are interested in applying for or throwing your hat in the ring for nomination for any of the board member positions, John Pinto is the man to contact. All right. Well, thank you, Frank. And thanks for filling in for me for uh, explaining about the election. So I look forward to uh, people who throw their hat in the ring, as you said. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you have a more technical term for that, but that's all. That's, a, that's the perfect, perfect. I was thinking of a better way to say it, but that's actually perfect. Okay. So um, this is going to be sort of an abbreviated version of what I normally do, which is what's up in the sky. I am just going to focus on calendar events over the next few months um, until we get together again in September. So stuff you may want to look at in the sky. Um, most of my stuff is gonna be visual, so you don't even need astrophotography to do these things. You don't even need a telescope for most of this. You might need a binoculars for a few things, uh, but these are things to help you orient yourself in the sky over the next few months, especially if you're a new, uh, new amateur astronomer just, just getting started. That's why I'm calling up market calendars, because if you do have a calendar, you're going to want to mark it up. Uh, obviously, Frank will put this up on YouTube. So don't, you know, go run it for your calendar right now. You can go and play this back later. All right, let's get going. All right, so what is left in July in the sky? So tomorrow... Uh, morning, if you are an early bird and you're up before the sun... Um, the moon will be just below the Pleiades. I would expect some of our folks with good photography skills might be able to get a very nice shot of the moon, the crescent moon below the Pleiades. That's probably going to be very, very pretty to, to see in uh, our next astrophotography uh, session in September. Coming up on Saturday, this is the one you might need binoculars for. So after the sun sets, Mercury is now up in the west after sunset. It is going to be near the Beehive Cluster. So again, that, that probably would be a good astrophotography, uh, a very simple astrophotography shot um, because uh, they're both pretty bright. And uh, that, again, will be a very pretty sight. If you don't want to take a picture of it, just get your binoculars out. Look for Mercury near the Beehive Cluster. Uh, Monday is a new moon, so um, if we have clear skies, it, that's a very good time to be outside uh, because the moon will not be disturbing your night vision. Next Wednesday and Thursday, um, there's going to be a nice uh, grouping of the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Regulus uh, in the night sky just after sunset. Um, again, you might need binoculars for Mercury because it is still pretty low. Um, but um, as much of this as you can see, uh, that should be a wonderful uh, 
sight in the in the western sky after sunset. Saturday the 22nd, they're still there. Um, but now what's going to happen is you're going to see Mars, Regulus, and Mercury basically in a in a straight line in the sky. Um, Venus will still be up, up there, obviously, because it's it's very bright. Uh, but the thing you want to see if you can see again, assuming we get good weather, is Mars, Regulus, and Mercury. Following that on Monday, again in the evening. Now, this is where some of this uh, is helpful for the new people. Um, and you're still learning your way around the sky. Everybody knows how to find the moon, right? But you may not know what star or planet the moon is next to. And you're starting to learn, you know, what, what these stars and planets are. Where, you know, you see that bright red star in the sky. What What is that? So this is one of those things you can do. This is the um, star Spica or Spica. And... Uh, if you go out on Monday, uh, the 24th in the evening, in the southwest, you find the moon. The bright star near the moon is going to be Spica or Spica. And that's in the constellation of Virgo. On the 25th is the first quarter moon. And the reason I bring that up is that's a favorite time to look at the moon because you get the shadow, which we call the Terminator, uh, going across the craters of the moon and gives you uh, beautiful images of the moon, whether you want to take a picture of it or just look at it in binoculars or in a telescope. Um, that's always uh, a wonderful time to start looking at the moon. On the 28th, back to the west after dark, um, Mercury will be very close to Regulus, almost a conjunction. Um, they'll be within 10 minutes of each other, which is, um, you would not be, I don't think you'll even be able to separate that with your with your naked eye, so you will definitely need binoculars to separate those two. And finally, later that evening, the moon will be near the red star Antares. That'll be in the constellation of Scorpio, Scorpius. Um, and again, another way to start learning uh, some of the brighter stars in the sky when the moon is near them. All right, August is kind of chock full of events. so. Uh, go through this a little bit quicker. Uh, Tuesday the 1st is a full moon called the full sturgeon moon. On the 2nd, I, for those of you who want to get into variable stars, um, I know Barbara's probably going to be coming up talking about something much more exciting, but to get started, I know for me this was uh, my introduction to variable stars is to start watching Algol, uh, which is probably the most famous variable star in the sky. Uh, we're start, now going to start having minimums of that variable start in the morning. Uh, later in the year, we'll have them in the, in the evening. But right now, uh, because uh, Algol is rising um, around 4 a.m., 4.30 in the morning, uh, this is when you're going to uh, be able to see that minimum. Uh, also, on the next day, on Thursday the 3rd, you're going to see the moon near Saturn. Again, if you're not sure where Saturn is in the sky, that's a day to be out in the early morning to see where the moon is because the bright star that it's going to be next to is not a star. It's the planet Saturn. Uh, on the 8th of August is the last quarter moon and it will be near Jupiter. Again, the bright thing that's near the moon on that, e on that uh, early morning uh, is the planet Jupiter. Uh, later on, again, the moon's coming back to see to be near the Pleiades like it is going to be tomorrow morning. And then Thursday, the 10th, Mercury and Mars will be very close to each other, within five degrees of each other. And that will go on for five nights in a row. So you have plenty of time, hopefully, to get at least one good, good day when there's not a storm in the evening. And we can see that. Okay, this is a very important one, probably the most important one of my whole uh, presentation is Sunday, August 13th, early morning. So after midnight, but before the sun comes up, is when the Perseid meteor shower will peak. I don't know if we're gonna be getting together uh, uh, Saturday night. Uh, I know sometimes we do uh, as, a, as a club, keep an eye on groups IO if anybody puts something out that we're gonna meet somewhere um, and try to see the Perseid meteor shower. Again, obviously it all depends on the weather. Wednesday the 16th is a new moon. On the 18th, now the moon, uh, because it's just 
past new, it's now going to be in the west right after a sunset. Uh, the moon will be right next to Mars within one degree. Again, a very pretty sight. On the 24th, the first quarter moon will just miss occulting the star Antares. We had talked about that this month that the moon will be near Antares, but next month on the 24th, if you go a little bit further north from here, I think if you're in Georgia, it actually does occult Antares, but here it's just going to miss it by a hair. Uh, the 27th is when Saturn is opposition. I know you guys were just talking about that, but again, that is when Saturn will be due south at midnight. And when it's will be the closest to it or very close to being closest to it. So that's a good time to, to look at it in your telescope. And on the 30th, we have what's called a blue moon. It's the second full moon within the same month. So we had one uh, full moon on the first and then the second one in August is on the 30th and that is called the full blue moon. Because if you ever wanted to know what's a blue moon, it's that's what it is too. There's actually some other technical term to make it a blue moon, but we'll go with the common one, two full moons in the same month. All right, we're closing up here. Uh, on the 6th in September is the last quarter moon. On the 11th, the moon will be near the beehive cluster where Mercury was going to be this month. But now you can get the moon near it. Another algal minimum will be on the 14th in the morning. And on the, again on the 14th is a new moon. So that weekend will be a good weekend to take your telescope out. And on the 16th, while we when we get together, uh, we will be able to see the moon and the Mars very close together again. And I'm sure we'll all be looking at that with our telescopes that, that evening. And that's it for me. However, I do want to make sure everybody understands that we have a quite a number of places online for you to follow up on CFIS events and things that are happening in the sky. So the first place I always tell people to go is to our CFIS fan page. Anybody can get to this. You don't need to join. Uh, it's kind of our social media hub for Facebook. Uh, we always post you know, beginner information there. Uh, obviously, we also have our private Facebook group, which is only open to CFIS members. Uh, you'll find it there. And of course, we have our official Groups IO site to communicate with each other and receive our official CFIS announcements. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Frank. Oh, I'm sorry. We're also on Instagram. <laughs> Hopefully, there'll be yes. more posts soon. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, and a reminder, you know, if anybody wants to sort of informally organize an observing event for the uh, Perseids or any other event, um, feel free to do so. Just send out a note on Groups.io and say, hey, everyone, I'm going to go view this event here. Anyone want to join me? You're like, it doesn't have to be official. So uh, those sort of impromptu gatherings are very much encouraged. So make that happen. And remember, too, uh, even though it may look cloudy during the day, often during the pre-dawn hours, it's pretty clear. Um, so you know, there's still stuff to see if you're an early riser. Also, I neglected to mention, um, if you are watching and not a CFAST member yet, what are you waiting for? Go to CFAST.org. You can sign up there for one of three membership levels and uh, get exclusive access to our Dark Sky Observing events and uh, some even better in-person meetings going forward. And I see uh, Barbara Harris is with us. Uh, Barbara, are you there? Yeah, sorry for the late start. I Or my husband had an emergency that I had to help him with, so... Oh, I'm sorry. Are you able to present? We can. Sure. I can kill time. If... Yeah, I'm. I'm ready. Okay. Cool. I'll let you take it away. Okay. Let's uh, share my screen. Okay. So my variable star this month is uh, the variable star called uh, SS Signe. Uh, the variable star uh, that I'm going to present about is a dwarf nova, um, and it's called SS Cygni. It's be it belongs to a group of variable stars called eruptive novae, and um, it it's actually uh, in, in a subclass of novae that includes supernovae that I talked about last month. Uh, so this group is a dwarf novae, 
and it's uh, uh, the least energetic as far as uh, eruptions in the cataclysmic variable class of Novaya. So this particular uh, variable star is a dwarf Novaya. It's a binary star system. It consists of a white dwarf plus a main sequence red dwarf. Um, the red, the gravitational pull of the white dwarf pulls material from the companion star. This material forms what's called an accretion disk around the white dwarf. And once there's a critical mass in this accretion disk, it actually uh, goes into outburst and uh, the star becomes significantly br brighter. So SS Cygni was actually discovered by uh, Louisa D. Wells. She was what was called a computer at the Harvard College Observatory in 1896. The magnitude range is between 7.7 .7 and 12.4 uh, in V magnitude. It has an orbital period of 6.6 .6 hours. So the white dwarf and red dwarf star are actually rotating around, uh, orbiting around each other pretty fast. The outbursts, the large outbursts occur anywhere from 50 to 100 days. And usually the change is, is about five magnitudes or greater. The distance of SS from the Earth is about 370 uh, light years. Like I said, the primary star in these systems are always the white dwarf. And the secondary star in this particular system is a red dwarf. And it's act, the SS Cygni uh, star is actually a prototype uh, star of this dwarf Novi. Uh, Novi category. So to find it, uh, if, if you map out the uh, summer triangle uh, in the sky, here's the Deneb at the, uh, uh, the foot of uh, Cygnus. And it's about 11 degrees east of uh, Cygnus. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, here's Deneb. Um, Here's M39 also, so if, if you're uh, trying to uh, star hop to it, uh, it's about well, four degrees uh, southeast of M39. This is one of my uh, images for photometry of SSIG. Um, this is when it's close to outbursts. Uh, or kind of in between. I think the magnitude here uh, was about uh, 10.9 or, or 11, uh, around that. And I love this field in my, um, in my images because I love this little galaxy group over here. Uh, so that this width is about 17 arc minutes. Here's an, A, uh, an AAVSO light curve of SS Cygni over the last year from July 1st of 2022 to July 1st of uh, 2023. And uh, you, this is in a V filter and the, the black circles are actually visual estimates of it through a telescope and an eyepiece. And, and you can see these uh, outbursts. And one thing that catches you about these, eye, these outbursts they're not always the same. Some uh, outbursts are a little bit shorter than the than the others. Uh, some are a little bit uh, brighter magnitude. Uh, so the the brightness of the outbursts are a little different. Also, the interval in between the outbursts are different. Uh, it tends to be around fifty to sixty uh, days between outbursts. Uh, lately, it's been close to about a month between outbursts. Uh, so these systems are are very um, they're predictable in one way, but unpredictable in others because you never know uh, exactly when the outburst is going to occur, and you never know exactly how bright it's going to be. Um, like also, if you look uh, at these uh, the uh, brightest magnitude. They're about uh, 8.5 to like 8.2 magnitude. 
and uh, in general, the magnitude are even brighter at outbursts at about 7.7. .7. So the last year, the outbursts have been a little bit uh, dimmer than uh, usual. So these can be unpredictable systems, and uh, it's kind of nice to watch to find out when it's going to go into outbursts and how bright it's going to be. Um, when it does reach outbursts, it usually stays there for a day or two and then uh, abruptly starts to fade again. So uh, these are nice to follow. And, and SS Cygni is a, a very uh, observed star. It's never missed an outburst as far as observations are concerned. So from uh, the late 1800s, uh, every outburst of SS Cygni has been observed. And this is a poster of uh, SS Cygni for uh, between 1900 and 2010. And um, you could see from uh, this poster uh, that sometimes they're a lot more frequent, like down in this year, which is like 1963. Some are a little bit more spaced out, uh, like here in 1935, they're not as frequent as, as this year. Um, so, and if you examine them closely, you'll know that some are, are not as bright as, as others. So it's a very interesting star to observe. Uh, there are a lot of AAVSO observations in the visual range with just an eyepiece and a telescope. Um, at, at least the, the outburst uh, uh, can be observed in a, a small telescope uh, and it, it easily can be imaged uh, even even at its faintest uh, with a DSLR camera. So uh, this is a very, one of the more interesting uh, variable stars to watch. Okay. I wanna stop sharing. All right, thank you, Barbara. And everyone, if you have questions for Barbara or any of our speakers, uh, please hit the Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen and you can enter your questions there. We'll, we'll answer whatever we can. Uh, let me see if I can rest control of your screen here. There we go. All right, you should be good, Barbara. Um, I have a question for you, Barbara. So 1900, uh, does AAVSO actually go back that far as an organization? Uh, yes, as an organization, I think they started um, officially as an organization in the early 1900s. Uh, I think it was 1910 or 1911. Uh, but uh, so they they have um, visual observations even before that uh, that they've gone back and, and collected. Um, but they have glass plates also of um, from Harvard College Observatory when it wasn't a, there wasn't an AAVSO yet. Uh, so Harvard College Observatory uh, was making these uh, variable star discoveries and cataloging them even before AAVSO existed. Right. And and most of these very early variable star. Um, observations from America, oh, excuse me, uh, were from women. Uh, they recall computers and uh, astronomers, uh, Harvard College Observatory not only had uh, observatories here in the United States, but down in Peru, um, they had an observatory uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And so they would take these glass plates and they were shipped to um, this room of, of women computers and they would analyze the glass plates and a lot of um, variable stars were discovered by these women examining the photographic uh, glass plates and these glass plates actually still exist in at um, uh, I can't remember the name of the facility it's not called Harvard College Observatory although it's still connected to them but you could actually go and and check out and see all of these glass plates all the way back from the 1800s. And so some, fortunately, they've all been digitized now. 
but you could actually go back and there are several professional astronomers will actually examine these plates. If they see something unusual in a star, they can go back to the 1800s and look at the glass plates at these stars. Yeah, it's amazing. Are there challenges in normalizing that data? Like, how do you compare uh, an image from an 1800 glass plate to a digital CCD image today? That I don't know, but they they have had a team over several the last several years uh, that have been able to do that to uh, to take those observations from the 1800s and then normalize them to today's data. Very cool. <clears throat> Yeah, I noticed just how consistent that data was going back to 900 in that graph you saw. And I was kind of amazed at uh, how that data could be teased out to such precision. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I'm actually reading a book now, uh, The Last Stargazers by Emily Levesque. And she touches on some of that history of the old glass plates and how they were analyzed as well. So there's a lot of fun stories from that era. Apparently yeah, preparing those plates was a, a challenge as well. Yeah, there's a book, I think it's called... Um, the Looking Glass, maybe. I, do, I don't remember the name of it. I read it a few years ago. But it's basically about these uh, women called computers, you know, that examine these glass plates from the, uh, from the 1800s. And they were, they were incredible. And a lot of the discoveries that they made, like they attributed the discovery of S.S. Signy to that particular uh, woman, uh, uh, computer, but a lot of the uh, discoveries were attributed to the professional astronomer who ran the um, Harvard College Observatory, Edward Pickering. And sometimes he was he was uh, gracious enough to to let the credit be given to one of the woman uh, observers uh, doing the the actual uh, discoveries. Uh, but a lot of the discoveries were attributed to him since he was the professional astronomer in charge of all these women computers. Yep. A lot of unsung women in the field, for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was reading, too, that uh, at some of the big observatories, they would only allow men in the dormitories for a long time. And it was just hard to even be a woman at those settings. So I'm glad we've progressed from that. Um, also, if you have an amateur astronomy magazine, uh, this month they have a really good write-up about Carolyn Herschel. Uh, not really about glass plates, but about her contributions to uh, observational astronomy back with um, her brother, uh, the Herschel that you know that uh, discovered Uranus. I had the pleasure of uh, visiting their home, our former home in Bath, England earlier this year. So that was an interesting little side trip for some astrophotography, uh, astrotourism rather. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barbara. And uh, speaking of variable stars, that's a very violent aspect of the universe. Speaking of violent universes, I see we just have Dr. Katie Mack join us, the author of The End of Everything. So uh, all about violent ends to the universe. Appreciate that. Thanks for joining us, Katie. Let me uh, read your bio here real quick and we'll, uh, we'll have you on if you're ready. Uh, yeah, so Katie Mack, uh, Dr. Catherine Mack is a theoretical astrophysicist who studies a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end. She currently holds the position of Hawking Chair in Cosmology and Science Communication at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, where she carries out research on dark matter and the early universe and works to make physics more accessible to the general public, which is what you're doing tonight. She is the author of the book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, which um, I personally loved. If you, uh, if you like co the cosmology and you like dark, snarky humor, this is the book for you. It's just a, a rundown of all the various ways in which the universe wants to kill you and wants to end itself. Uh, personally, I am a favor of uh, vacuum decay because um, that doesn't sound like such a bad way to go. Um, also, a author for Scientific American, Slate, BBC, Science, Sky and Telescope, Cosmos Magazine, and you can find her on Twitter as Astro Katie. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Katie Mack. Let me uh, give you co-host permissions here so you can share your screen. Take it away. All right. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, let me get my sharing going here. Um, all right, so can you see my uh, slides there and my pointer? Yes, we're all good. good. And thanks okay. for joining us. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, so um, I I was asked to talk a little bit about dark matter. So um, that's that's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, dark matter is my main area of research. I the the end of the universe stuff is is something I also dabble in, but um, in terms of my my kind of day to day research, uh, dark matter is is where I spend most of my time, and um, and I it, it's it's a fascinating subject because it holds a, a, the key to understanding not just a huge fraction of the universe, but also um, some really deep questions about uh, particle physics and our understanding of, you know, fundamental physics in general. So. Um, just to, to get everybody oriented, you know, we live in um, in the Milky Way, and when we think, think of a galaxy, when we're not inside of it, we we think of something, you know, uh, that looks sort of like this. We see the stars, the gas, the dust, the glowing, luminous aspects of the universe, and when we see galaxies um, in in general in the universe, when we look out into the cosmos, we we are always seeing that that luminous portion of the universe. We're seeing those, those bright stars, we're seeing that glowing dust, but that's really just kind of the window dressing on the universe. The, the vast majority of the cosmos is just completely invisible. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about dark matter. I'll say a little bit about dark energy too. Um, but uh, when I talk about dark matter, sometimes uh, I like to use, you know, analogies to, to make it more Kind of clear what's going on to, to compare to things people are familiar with. So with dark matter, I often like to um, compare it to the force. Okay, so we all know from Star Wars that the force is what gives a Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. That's, that's how Obi-Wan Kenobi explained the force to Luke Skywalker. Now, we can compare uh, these statements to what we know about dark matter to get some insight into, into what dark matter might be. So um, the first, uh, first one, you know, giving Jedi power, um, as far as we know, there's no connection between dark matter and special powers. Also, you know, not all Jedi are male, so clearly that, uh, that uh, statement doesn't apply. The next one, though, an energy field. There's a sense in which you can think of dark matter as an energy field in the sense that it's a kind of matter. So matter being something that has mass and there is a connection between anything with anything, you know, matter and energy. So, you know, matter has energy. Um, so you can think of it in, in that way. But but when we talk about dark matter, the, the key thing is really that it does have mass because we we see it through its gravitational interaction with um, with other things in the universe. And so that's really the matter, the mass, uh, the matter aspect of it being really important. Um, the next aspect created by all living things, oh, that's, that's not the case as far as we know. People, uh, other living things don't have anything to do with dark matter, but there is a sense in which without dark matter, there would be no living things because uh, dark matter was is really key to the growth of structure in the early universe. Um, and allowed the galaxy to to form in the way it did. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, the next part, though, surrounds us. Yes. So when, as far as we know, dark matter is something that um, really kind of engulfs uh, galaxies, engulfs uh, large collections of matter. So when you think of a galaxy, you should really think of like that you know the bright glowing part, the disk or whatever, embedded in a in a sort of a giant clump. Of, of dark matter. And so in that sense, the, the dark matter really is surrounding um, the, the galaxy, it's, it's engulfing a galaxy. Um, the next question uh, penetrates us. Yes, so as we understand dark matter, it seems to be something that can pass through itself and other matter without interacting in any way that we are aware of. So the main, the main property of dark matter is that it does seem to be invisible. And invisibility uh, comes about because, okay, so it doesn't reflect light, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't emit light. Um, that means it's just, it's not interacting with photons, photons being the, the carriers of light, the particles of light. And photons are the carriers of the electromagnetic force. 
And as it happens, electromagnetism is also why we can touch things. So whenever you touch something, what you're really doing is you're pushing your electrons against the electrons in that object. And it's the electrostatic repulsion that you're feeling. That's why things feel solid. So if you have a particle or something that doesn't do electromagnetism, that's invisible, doesn't interact with light, it's not going to interact with electromagnetism at all. And so it's it's not going to be something that you can touch. We call that collisionless. And that means that it can pass through itself. It can pass through other matter. It can pass through us in this room. It goes right through the earth. Um, or in a sense, we're kind of moving through that cloud of dark matter as the earth is moving around the sun and the sun is moving around in the galaxy. And then the final piece binds the galaxy together. Yes. So dark matter does seem to be what provides the, the bulk of the gravity in a galaxy that holds all the stars and the gas and the dust into that galaxy. It does seem to be what binds the galaxy together. Um, so, you know, pretty, pretty close. Um, so when, as I said, so when you see a galaxy like this, this is the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor large galaxy, you should really be imagining that it is embedded in this clump of dark matter. Um, and that dark matter is the invisible stuff, but it's most of the gravity of the galaxy. It's something like 85% of the mass of the galaxy is that invisible stuff that the, the, the stars and gas and dust, all the luminous matter is just embedded in. Okay, so if we say it's invisible, uh, how do we know it's there? Um, and uh, there, there are several things that we, we can, uh, several indications for the presence of dark matter. Um, so generally speaking, we, we know about the presence of dark matter because we see luminous things moving in ways that would not otherwise make sense. So in this um, animation here, there's a person waving her arms around. And um, and so because she is waving her arms around and holding these fiery objects, we see fire moving around in ways that fire should not be moving. And so we can infer, even if we can't really see the person in the middle, we can infer that there is a person there doing that waving around um, because uh, the, the fire is moving in circles when it should be just flying off, uh, you know, in one direction or, or sitting still, right? And so this is very similar with galaxies. We see stars moving in ways that they would not otherwise move if there were not something holding, pulling them in, um, right? And so one of the people who really um, made that insight clear in the 1970s is this person, Vera Rubin. Um, who was not the first person to study dark matter, not the first person to get evidence of dark matter, but really um, her her data with her colleagues uh, really showed um, how uh, how strong the case for dark matter in, in spiral galaxies was. And so what she was doing is she was looking at spiral galaxies and spiral galaxies rotate, um, not really like this, but this the stars and gas and, and dust all go around the center of the galaxy. Um, and she was looking at that rotation because by looking at how uh, the components of the galaxy are rotating around the center, it should tell you something about the gravity um, of the stuff in the galaxy. Um, and there, then when you when you look at a galaxy like this, um, the most of the light is coming from really the very central regions. Um, the the central part of a galaxy is, is called the bulge, the central bulge in a spiral galaxy, um, and that that tends to contain the vast majority of the stellar mass, and then you know, all of the the kind of the stuff in the disk is very thin, very um, uh, diffuse, um, and there's there's not a whole lot of gravity, uh, not a whole lot of like mass of stars outside of that central bulge. And so, what you expect to see when you look at how these stars are moving around in the galaxy is you expect to see something uh, like like this. So this is an animation of um, the way that, that stars would move around a galaxy if, if most of the matter is, is concentrated in the central bulge there and the stars are just kind of moving around in response to the gravity of the central bulge. And that's what you would expect for uh, for a galaxy like this. It's also what you'd expect for like a solar system where, you know, in the solar system you have the sun in the middle, that's most of the mass of the solar system. And then the inner planets are moving around really quickly because they're close to um, the uh, gravitational uh, feel the the gravitational force. They're they're feeling the a much stronger gravitational force because they're very close to the central mass, whereas the outer planets are moving around very slowly because they're feeling much weaker gravity. And so, if they moved any faster, they would kind of escape uh, the galaxy, right? So they're all kind of responding to the the gravity of the central object. But what Vera Rubin and her colleagues saw was something that's more like this. 
Now, it, it looks like a bit of a subtle difference, but if you watch carefully, the central dots are moving around just are moving just as quickly as the outer dots. Um, the ones in the center are getting getting around faster because they're getting around in less time because there's they have less far to go. But um, they're moving the same, all the dots in the in the right-hand animation are moving at the same speed. Um, and that's what uh, Vera Rubin and her colleagues saw with these galaxies was that she saw that, that the outer stars in the galaxies were not slower, um, even though they were farther from the center. And so this is the uh, rotation curves uh, from one of the papers that they, they observed of, from these galaxies. So this is the rotational velocity as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy. And what she saw is that it was basically flat after a certain point everything's going about the same speed. Now, if if really all there was was the visible matter, you'd expect that rotation curve to drop like this. That's the like so-called Keplerian rotation curve that would be more like what you'd see, in, whoops, um, hold on. What you'd see in a solar system is uh, it would drop, um, it would drop down as you go farther out. Um, so it's kind of like if you, if you uh, have uh, some kids playing on a merry-go-round, and if, if this big kid pushes that merry-go-round too fast, then the little kid is, is going to just fly off into space, right? The, the, there's a limit to how fast that, that little kid can be going because, um, you know, his arms are just not that strong, so he shouldn't be able to hold on that much. And what, what these stars seem to be doing is they're going way too fast for the amount of gravity that was holding them in. And so it's kind of like if you, if you see that merry-go-round is going round and round really, really fast, but that kid is still there, then there's got to be some kind of like invisible seatbelt, like holding him onto that merry-go-round. And that's kind of what they um, what they found with these with these galaxies is there has to be something holding those stars in because they're going way too fast to be held in by just the, the amount of um, matter that was seen. And so that's how you infer that there's a, a kind of um, invisible clump of this extra matter so that um, it's not all concentrated in the center, it's spread throughout. So as you even as you go farther out in the galaxy, um, the there's more matter, you know, interior to where you're where you are, and so your your the amount of gravity that's holding you in is kind of staying the same as you go as you go farther out because it's it's spread more through the galaxy. Now there is other evidence for dark matter, and I, I have to make that really clear because there are a lot of ways to get a flat rotation curve. Um, if you follow discussions about dark matter um, in in sort of articles in the popular press, every couple of months there will be a new article saying that somebody is claiming that they don't need dark matter because they can get a rotation curve without dark matter um, by changing gravity. And that is true, you can do lots of, you can get a, rota a flat rotation curve in lots of different ways. Um, but uh, there are there are lots of pieces of evidence for dark matter that, that um, really everything comes together if dark matter is real and just changing gravity only explains a few of them. So um, I'm going to talk about one other thing that we see um, that's evidence for dark matter, which has to do with uh, general relativity. Um, so Einstein's theory of gravity. So this is kind of a cartoon idea of what general relativity is saying. It's basically general relativity is this idea that when there is a massive thing in the universe, it bends the space around it. Now, this is a cartoon where, you know, that, that massive object is kind of bending a two-dimensional space. Really, you have to imagine like a three-dimensional space and, and a massive object is kind of pulling that space in in all directions around it, pulling it towards itself. Um, but for the purpose of illustration, we'll look at this, uh, this kind of 2D um, uh, analogy. So the idea is that you have a dent in space where there's a massive object. And so things that are moving past that massive object, um, even if they try to move in a straight line, they're moving through a curved space. So their path is gonna be curved by the fact that they're moving through that curved space. And so that's how you end up with things like orbits is that the, um, the space that something is moving through is curved by the matter um, that, that it's moving past. And that works with light as well. So if you, if you replace that satellite with a beam of light, then that beam of light will also be traveling through curved space and that beam of light will also bend. And so that's a phenomenon called gravitational lensing where the, the um, path of light through curved space is affected by the curvature of the space. And so light can follow different light paths. And so we see that all the time in the cosmos and the kind of setup that we often see is that we'll be looking uh, from the earth at some distant galaxy. And in the middle, there's a cluster of galaxies um, creating a big dent in space, creating a, a huge curvature of space. And so the, the 
image of that distant galaxy, the light from the distant galaxy is bent around and might come to us from multiple directions, which will give us multiple images of that distant galaxy or distorted images of that distant galaxy. Um, and that's called strong gravitational lensing. Uh, this is a nice uh, sort of animation of simulation of uh, gravitational lensing by a spherical mass moving across a background um, of stars or, or galaxies. And um, I like this illustration a lot because the spherical object itself is invisible, but you can very much see where it is and you can see what it's doing because it is, it is distorting the light from all those distant objects. And you can see the way that the light gets distorted, which is that if you have a round object and, and you know dark matter halos tend to be sort of spherical-ish, um, then you get these giant arcs that are created as the as the object moves through, and you can see as well that some of sometimes these arcs can give you sort of circles. Um, they can give you uh, multiple images of the same background source as it gets spread out, um, and so you get these these rings and these sort of tangential um, arcs of light. Um, and we do see that in in the universe all the time. So this is an image from JWST from just a few months ago where there's a cluster of galaxies here, and we see um, these giant arcs from these background images of distant galaxies. And you can see there's there's definitely a kind of circular-ish uh, kind of pattern to those giant arcs, and that's the distorted images of those background galaxies. Um, then we can see uh, uh, individual uh, galaxies that are really spread out and distorted by that gravitational lensing. And the important thing about gravitational lensing is that it's 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 it, due to the presence of matter. It doesn't matter if that matter is visible or not. It's the it's the the mass itself. And so, the fact that that by looking at the amount of gravitational lensing we see, the pattern of that gravitational lensing, we can tell that there has to be more matter than what we can count up by counting the, the all the stars in in some galaxy, right? So there, there so these kinds of lensing images give us an indication of the halo of dark matter. We call it a, a halo, that clump of dark matter that surrounds these clusters of galaxies or, or individual galaxies in some cases. And so here's another cluster of galaxies where it's lensing a background object and you can see that object smeared around over here and multiply imaged on the other side. And that's that's giving us a total accounting of the matter and there just has to be more matter than the stuff that we can see when we, when we do these observations. Um, sometimes you can get the the alignment really perfect, um, like the, a couple of those frames in that I illustration, and you get what's called an Einstein ring. Um, and so this is a you know a, a massive galaxy with a, a little tiny blue galaxy in the, in the far distance that's that's uh, sort of stretched all around. Um, and uh, and sometimes you can get a happy face. And and these uh, these uh, images are really great uh, for accounting for how much mass there really is out there. Okay, so okay, so I've told you this there. So what is it? Now this is the uh, this is the important question. Um, this is the question that uh, that we all want to know the answer to. Um, uh, there there are a number of ideas. I'm going to tell you about the kind of usual assumption for what dark matter is, but I'll tell you about some other possibilities as well. So the usual assumption is dark matter is some kind of weakly interacting massive particle. Um, when I say weakly interacting massive particle, I mean weakly in the sense that it interacts either weakly um, or not at all with, uh, with other matter. So weakly there can mean just a little bit, or it can mean via the weak nuclear force, um, which is a force that has to do with sort of um, radioactive decay and a number of other things um, acts on a, on a sort of subatomic scale. Um, when I say massive, I mean it just has mass, not that it's particularly heavy, but it has to have some mass because that's what it's doing out there. It's, it's creating that extra gravity. Um, and when I say particle, I mean it, it really acts like it's a collection of particles that are just not interacting with each other except via gravity. Um, so that um, that idea of a weakly interacting massive particle has been around for a while. It's usually abbreviated a WIMP. And so um, you can uh, you can ask, you know, so if if the dark matter is this weakly interacting massive particle, um, how does that fit into what we know about other particles in the universe? Which ones? Which one of these particles? Are we blaming for the dark matter? Well, so we have a set of particles that are the standard model of particle physics. 
Um, and we can put them in a little chart. The, this is um, all of the particles that we'd ever interacted with detected up until 2012. And then in 2012, we found another one, the Higgs boson. Um, so now we have this, this set of particles that are, that are everything that's ever been uh, detected in a particle detector, everything that we know for certain exists in the universe as, as a, an individual particle. So I'll just walk through these briefly. So in the purple, these are the quarks. So the quarks are the components of protons and neutrons and, and a number of other particles called baryons and mesons. Um, and uh, they have uh, six different so-called flavors. They're in the up and the down quarks are the things that make up protons and neutrons, although it gets a lot more complicated than that if you look too hard at, at protons and neutrons, but we won't get into that today. Um, then there's the, uh, the green is the leptons. So there's the neutrinos, which are these sort of ghostly particles that are produced in nuclear fusion and they come from the sun and other stars and they're passing through us all the time. Um, and there's the, the electron, the muon, and the tau. So the electron is, you know, the particle that goes around the protons and neutrons in the center of the atom, only not really in an orbit, more in a kind of fuzzy haze of electron probabilityness when you get into the, the details of it. But there are the particles uh, sort of on the outside of the of the atom, and then the muon and tau are just heavier partners of, of the electron. And then the ones in the red here, these are the gauge bosons. These are the force carriers. So there's the photon, which is the carrier of the electromagnetic force. There's the gluon, which carries the strong force, which holds those protons and neutrons together and holds everything in the centers of, of um, nuclei. And then the W and Z bosons are the, uh, for the carriers of the weak nuclear force. And um, the Higgs boson, as you, as you may know, has something to do with how particles got mass in the early universe. There's a whole long story behind that, um, but it's, uh, it's connected with a process that occurred in the early universe that brought, um, that sort of set the stage for, for the particle physics we understand today. Um, so, okay, we can ask which of these can be uh, candidates for the dark matter. So what we know about the dark matter is we know that it has to be massive. It has to have some mass. Um, so we can eliminate the massless particles from this picture. So the photon and the gluon are eliminated. We know that it has to be long lived. Um, so it can't be a particle that, that if left to its own devices decays away into other particles really quickly because it's been around since the beginning of the universe. And that actually gets rid of most of the rest of the particles. All these other particles decay into other things if you, if you let them sit around too long. Um, it has to have no electric charge because it doesn't interact with electromagnetism, so it can't have an electric charge, so that gets rid of the up and down quarks and the electron. And then the final piece um, is that it has to be slow moving, and what I mean by that is um, if the particles are moving around too quickly, then they, they won't collect into clumps um, in, um, uh, in galaxies. They'll be kind of much more spread out through, through the universe. Um, Kind of uh, like I don't know, like um, if uh, if you if you heat up water too much, it um, it, it evaporates and, and spreads out through the room. If you get it cold, it, you can you can collect it into a small space. And so similarly with dark matter, it seems to need to be cold enough to collect into clumps. And the neutrinos move too fast. So the neutrinos are, in a sense, they're a kind of dark matter in the sense that they're weakly interacting. Uh, they interact only with the weak nuclear force. Um, they're massive in the sense they have a little bit of mass, at least, um, and they're particles, but they're not cold enough. So they're not what we call cold dark matter, so they don't fit the, uh, the bill. So, um, so none of those work. <laughs> uh, so it's not anything that's currently in the standard model of particle physics, um, which means that we have to sort of think beyond the standard model of particle physics if we want to understand what the dark matter is. Um, so there's we're going to have to add something to this picture. And this is why particle, why dark matter is such an interesting question from a particle physics perspective, because if we understood what it was, then we would know how we need to extend our standard model of particle physics and, and create some better model of particle physics, something more, more, um, uh, more conclusive, more extensive, more uh, comprehensive. And it's a matter of kind of opinion whether you think it's more extravagant to hypothesize that there's a single extra particle that's invisible and undetectable, or if there's several particles in a sort of dark sector that are all um, sort of things that we'll have to add to the standard model. And we don't know that yet. Um, but then the next question is, okay, so how do we find it? Um, we've said that it's invisible. We said that it's not any of the particles that we know about. 
what is it we can look for other than just watching stars move around weird? So the, um, the basic idea is that we hope that dark matter does do some kind of interaction with regular matter. Um, if it doesn't do any kind of interaction with regular matter other than gravity, gets a lot more complicated and we can talk about that later if you like, but there is some hope that um, that it has some interaction. Now we know that it's it's collisionless in the sense that if you just take regular matter and dark matter, and you throw them at each other, they'll pass right through each other um, as they do kind of every day um, when the dark matter is passing through the earth. Um, and you can, you know, you can keep doing that. They're gonna keep passing through, but it's possible that every once in a while, um, they will have an interaction via the weak nuclear force and actually interact in some way, right? Um, it's possible that the weak nuclear force allows for, you know, occasional um, occasional interactions. Maybe it's very small cross section in the sense that the, that it has to be a very direct hit. Um, maybe it's a very weak interaction, but it's hopefully there is some kind of weak interaction. So what we can do is we can draw this kind of diagram and say maybe, you know, there's if you if you throw the the dark matter and the regular matter particle at each other, they'll, they'll interact in some way. They'll scatter in some way. Um, and this is what we look for with direct detection. Uh, we look for the possibility that dark matter and regular matter can interact with each other sort of kinetically. Um, so what we'd actually see in that scenario, we can't see the dark matter. Um, so what we would see is that we would see a regular matter particle would bounce off something invisible or would be hit by something invisible. So we'd see a regular matter particle move, apparently in response to nothing. Um, and so we've built a bunch of experiments that look for exactly that. This is uh, one, one such experiment called the Xenon 1 ton experiment. Um, they've now gone up to the Xenon N ton experiment. It's much bigger. Um, and, uh, and what that is, is it's a tank of, of Xenon uh, with a bunch of sensors around it, a bunch of uh, ways to sort of monitor that, that liquid xenon. And what it's doing is it's looking for a particle to come in, a wimp particle um, to come in and bounce off of one of these atomic nuclei. And it's looking for that nuclear recoil, that that bouncing, that sort of um, interaction as that, that occurs. Now, a number of years ago, a whole bunch of different experiments were seeing what they thought might be some of those nuclear recoils. So I'm gonna show a picture, a plot from 2013 um, of the state of affairs in dark matter direct detection at that time. So here is a plot of, basically what you do is you look at uh, the, the motions of those, those nuclei and you say, well, based on how much that, that nuclei, nuclei um, the nucleus moved, um, there's that that can that indicates maybe it was hit by a particle of a particular mass with a particular uh, cross-sectional you know sort of interaction strength, um, and so you can think a plot of um, the strength of the interaction versus the mass of the dark matter particle, and you have these different regions um, where these colored in regions are the regions where some kind of signal seem to have been seen consistent with a, a particle of that mass and that interaction strength running into the stuff in the detector. And so at that time in 2013, you could look at this plot and you can kind of stand back and squint and say, maybe there's something going on in this region where this, you know, this sort of asterisk is. Maybe, you know, the, each of these experiments has some uncertainty, but possibly the dark matter is this mass and this interaction strength because it seems to be doing something in that part of the, of the plot. But then you look at this plot again and you see all these curved lines. These are all exclusion limits. Uh, meaning that there's other experiments that that looked at that parameter space, sorry, that looked um, looked for recoils and didn't see any recoils consistent with those energies and cross sections, and they all exclude the regions to the upper right. So what you see is that every one of these detections is ruled out by at least one other experiment, um, they, and they're saying that, that they didn't see anything at all, and that's that was the situation in 2013. Um, now, this is more recent, this is from uh, 2022, last year, um, now only one of those potential detection regions even still exists. The other ones were kind of taken out by um, better data from those experiments, um, but they're all, but even that one is, is just way more ruled out by way more experiments now. So it's unclear what's going on with that detection. Um, they see something, but it's, it's not clear whether it could possibly be uh, dark matter because other experiments look for the same thing and don't see that. Um, but there's definitely a bunch more limits that exist uh, that are sort of ruling out dark matter in this part of the parameter space. Now, what, what experiments are doing is mostly they're trying to get more sensitive, which means they're looking for, they can get more sensitive to lower masses 
and lower cross sections, lower interaction strengths, but they will at some point hit a wall. It's called the neutrino wall or sometimes called the neutrino fog. Um, so what's happening down here in this blue region with these colored uh, uh, spots in it, this is where you expect to see, this is where if you made your experiment this sensitive, then you would detect all of the neutrinos coming from the sun um, banging into the stuff in your in your experiment. So we cannot shield from neutrinos. It doesn't matter how far underground you put your detector. The neutrinos from the sun are going to come through, pass through the earth all the time, and they're going to run into stuff in your detector, and you will not be able to tell the difference between those uh, neutrino interactions and a dark matter particle if the dark matter particle is that um, is that mass and cross section. So it's going to get real complicated real soon. You can't just just keep making these experiments more sensitive. Uh, there are some interesting ideas to try to get around that, which I can tell you about if you're interested. But um, at the moment, it's it's looking a little bit difficult for uh, extending that part of the parameter space. Um, okay, so that's direct detection. We can look at this this uh, diagram in a different way, though, and look for something else. So what if you take uh, dark matter um, particles and you hit them with each other, you collide them with each other, and get regular matter out? Um, so this is the idea that dark matter might annihilate and produce regular matter. So maybe if you throw dark matter particles together, they annihilate with each other and regular matter comes out as the uh, byproduct of the, that interaction. And that's possible because it may be that dark matter is like its own antiparticle. If you take a part matter and an antimatter and you hit them together, you get, um, you get energy out. And maybe that, that could happen. Maybe dark matter particles could run into each other and create pairs of um, electrons and positrons or um, you know, quarks and antiquarks or something like that. Um, but what, we, what you would actually see in that instance is that you would see high energy particles just coming out of nowhere, just sort of appearing in places where you wouldn't expect anything to be producing them. And, um, and the places you would see that happen would be places where there's a lot of dark matter. So if you look at um, a diagram of you know the the whole sky, so this is a an all sky image sort of wrapped into an oval from the Gaia collaboration. You can see the center of the galaxy there and the disk of the galaxy and then the large and small Magellanic clouds. Um, if you if you take a projection like that of a of a simulation of where the dark matter might be in a hypothetical galaxy with hypothetical satellite galaxies around it. Um, and then, uh, and then say, where would we expect to see the, you know, extra high energy particles and radiation coming from? So this is this is a simulation of where you would look for those, um, you know, dark matter annihilation signals if you were just looking in a generic galaxy, right? So there would be a lot of it coming from the center of the galaxy because there's a high concentration of dark matter at the center of the galaxy, but there would also be some coming from dwarf galaxies that are sort of satellites of that central galaxy and, and little clumps of dark matter that might be there from substructure from dark matter. So you could find, you, so the place where the, the signal would be strongest would be the center of the galaxy, but you could also look at dwarf galaxies because um, they might be places where there's a lot of dark matter and not as much sort of stars and gas. And so you look for signals like that. Um, so there have been searches for, for dark matter annihilation energy coming from dwarf galaxies. We haven't seen that. Um, so there has not been any um, detection of like mysteriously uh, high energy particles or weird radiation coming from local dwarf galaxies, but there is an excess of gamma rays coming from the center of the galaxy. So this is a, um, a, a an image of the sky and gamma rays. And if you, if you, you know, tease apart that data, there's, there's a little bit of extra energy coming from the center. There's more uh, high energy gamma rays coming from the center of the galaxy in a way that's consistent with the idea that that's coming from dark matter annihilating at the center of the galaxy and creating high energy particles that then create extra, uh, uh, gamma rays. Um, so we don't know for sure what's going on there. There are lots of ideas about what it might be. Um, the problem is it's very hard to tell the, the center of the galaxy is a really busy place, okay? So it has stars and gas and dust and high magnetic fields. It's got a supermassive black hole. There's a lot going on. It might have a bunch of pulsars there, and those pulsars might be producing positrons and electrons that create gamma rays. Like, we don't know, um, and it's very hard to see into the center of the galaxy because you have to look through the whole galactic disk between here and there. 
um, and you you don't have very many uh, ways of getting the the light from there without it getting confused and absorbed by other stuff. Um, so it's, it's it's inconclusive, but there's been some really you know exciting talk about the possibility that we might be seeing uh, dark matter annihilation in the center of the galaxy. Now, there's one other way that people talk about looking for uh, dark matter which is to say, well, if dark matter can come together and annihilate to create regular matter, then it stands to reason that you can do the opposite and send regular matter together and produce dark matter. It's just kind of the reverse interaction. And so that's what we do. Uh, that's what we look for with production. And so what you would see in that case is you would take regular matter particles, slam them together, and then they would seem to disappear. Um, and so the, the way to do that is you go with the Large Hadron Collider, you collide protons together at high speed in these uh, long tunnels um, underneath the, the ground, um, and then you look at the, uh, the detector. So this is, this is the CMS particle detector. That's me. I got to go visit it um, a couple of years ago. Um, so this detector is there to gather all of the energy from the collisions when those particles and those protons collide and you put that together into an event display and you can see you know you create a collision all of these particles come out all this debris comes out and you can compare the amount of energy measured by the detector to the amount of energy you know you put in when you sent those protons together and basically what you're looking for is a mismatch you're looking for something something that would indicate that you know you threw a certain amount of energy in with those those um, collisions but you got less energy uh, out and that because some of the energy was turned into dark matter particles that then escaped the detector without being detected. Um, that's the idea behind uh, direct by behind production experiments. Unfortunately, we haven't seen anything there. So there's not been a, um, a missing energy or missing momentum signature that would indicate uh, dark matter, but you know uh, we're still looking for that. And there are a number of other ways that colliders look for dark matter through uh, looking for the production of you know weird new particles that could connect to dark matter in some way. So, okay, let's uh, sort of see where we stand now. So, direct detection um, we is is inconclusive. There's been some claims of detection. They've been ruled out by other experiments, but we don't still really know what's going on there. Uh, indirect detection also inconclusive. Um, there's a big excess of gamma rays at the galactic center. There have been a couple other weird anomalies, um, but it's hard because we'd have to understand everything else that's going on in the universe to really rule that out um, as being responsible for those signals. And then with production, uh, we just haven't seen anything. Um, but the astrophysical evidence is really very strong. So we're very sure <laughs> that dark matter is out there. It's not, it's not just the pieces of evidence that I showed you already. There's also evidence from the shapes of galaxies, the, the, um, the way that we can observe um, the ma mass distribution in clusters and filaments uh, between galaxies, the, the way that galaxies built up over time. Um, there's the abundance of elements from the Big Bang uh, nuclear synthesis process that all depends on the amount of collisional versus collisionless matter in the universe the large scale structure of the universe, the patterns in the cosmic microwave background. Um, I have a talk that I do sometimes where I go through 13 different pieces of evidence from astrophysics that dark matter is real. And the, the reason that that's important is because all of those different pieces of evidence in different contexts at different scales from different kinds of observations point to the same kind of stuff at the same abundance. So there's definitely something there. Um, but uh, we don't know what it is, and the sort of most simple models don't, don't seem to be working. So the the field has kind of blossomed out into a lot of different ideas about what dark matter might be. So there's the kind of you know normal weak uh, weakly interacting mass of particles the, from supersymmetry. Um, there's ideas about particles that might exist due to higher dimensional uh, space uh, that can allow the production of different kinds of particles. Um, there's different kinds of uh, sort of fa fancy kinds of neutrinos that that might um, contribute to the dark matter, things that are might like, might be heavier neutrinos than the ones we know about. Um, there's axions, which are a kind of uh, dark matter candidate that's um, uh, produced in a kind of different way in the very early universe and acts uh, can act as a sort of more like a wave than a particle in certain contexts in ways that gets kind of interesting. Um, there's primordial black holes, uh, black holes that might have been produced in the very early universe that might be very small and um, and uh, um, acting as dark matter in, in the modern day. 
Um, and then there's uh, things like self-interacting dark matter, which are just different kinds of particles that have different kinds of interactions. Um, and then there's still, you know, people still talk about sort of using modifications of gravity to explain dark matter, although I would say that these ones are the, the ones with the least amount of evidence behind them in terms of, um, and, you know, comp compared to the other ideas. So we're really branching out. We're really, it's a time to be really creative about models of dark matter, about ways to look for these different kinds of dark matter. Um, and it's a fun field to work in because there are so many different um, sort of theoretical possibilities, but there are also a lot of different observational possibilities. You know, there are a lot of different ways to look for the influence of dark matter. I have colleagues who look at how dark matter might have affected star stellar evolution, how it might have might affect exoplanets. Um, people looking at different ways to detect dark matter in laboratories, uh, ways to detect dark matter by how it interacts with black holes. There's a lot of really interesting things you can do. Um, so before I uh, finish up, I think I have about sort of five or 10 more minutes before we were going to go to questions. Um, I want to say a little bit about dark matter versus dark energy. So um, there's a... Um, that people often confuse the two, but but they really act in very opposite ways, basically. So dark matter is a kind of invisible stuff that we know that um, exists in galaxies. Dark energy is just a term we use for something that's making the universe expand faster. So we know that the universe is expanding, and the way that the universe is expanding is basically galaxies are getting farther apart from each other. Um, the more distant galaxies are getting farther apart faster. Um, there's just kind of more empty space happening all the time. And this is something that's been known since the 1920s, that the, that the universe is expanding, the galaxies are moving away from each other and moving away from us. Um, but uh, for a long time, it wasn't clear like how that motion, like how that expansion was evolving. Um, it was, there was a big question of whether the expansion of the universe was going to go on forever or whether it would stop at some point and uh, turn around. So, you know, um, basically the idea is if the if the expansion of the universe is going so fast um, that the gravity of all of the galaxies is not going to be able to pull it back, um, you know, then, then it's going to keep going forever. I mean, that gravity is always going to be slowing it down, you would expect, because um, gravity only works one way, and so as long as there are galaxies and they're pulling on each other, that's going to be slowing the expansion. Um, but uh, but you know that's sort of a balance between that gravity and and the expansion. It's kind of like if you if you like throw a ball up into the air, uh, what you're doing when you throw the ball in the air is you're you're pushing against the ball in the initial moment, and then as soon as you let it go, gravity is pulling on it and it's and it's decelerating. It's it's slowing down. It's moving. It's decelerating toward the Earth um, the whole time that it's in the air. At some point, it stops and it falls down because you didn't throw it hard enough. If you did throw it hard enough, if you threw it at eleven point two kilometers a second, in principle, then it would have escape velocity and it would it would continuously slow down, but it would leave the Earth. It would not fall back. Um, and if you threw it much faster, then it would it would just keep going, but but faster. Um, but it it would always be slowing down or maybe it would reach a steady speed, right? Um, but uh, in the 1990s, when astronomers were measuring this, uh, you know, trying to measure this deceleration parameter, the, how quickly the universe was slowing down to find out if it was going to re-collapse again, they found that it wasn't, it, the deceleration parameter was negative. Um, the, uh, the universe was not slowing down, the expansion was speeding up, and there was no good explanation for that. Something is making the universe expand faster. It seems to be counteracting the gravity of all of the galaxies. Um, we don't know what it is. We call it dark energy. Um, there, the best explanation we have at the moment is that maybe it's something like, that we call a cosmological constant, which is just kind of a property of space, that space has some stretchiness built in, that as the universe gets bigger, there's more space and there's more stretchiness, and so it just kind of compounds, and so that makes the universe expand faster and faster as it gets bigger and bigger, but we don't know. We know that it was slowing down for a while, and then about five or six billion years ago, it started speeding up. And um, if it keeps going the way it seems to be going, um, then that suggests that eventually our galaxy, or at least our little group of galaxies in the local group, which will at some point merge, um, they will be kind of isolated in the universe because all of the distant galaxies will be much farther away. And in about 100 billion years, if you put you know, a Hubble Space Telescope or JWST up into the, into the sky, it will not see other galaxies at all. Um, the rest of the universe will be black because everything will have moved so far away from us so quickly 
that the their light from it will be stretched out to the point where it will not be observable anymore. And so if things keep going the way we think we're going, it's going, then eventually the universe will become very cold and very dark. The stars in our galaxy will fade away. Uh, matter will decay. Everything will die. And that's how you get the heat death of the universe. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can read more about that in my book. But that's, um, that's the, uh, <laughs> the sort of fate of a universe that has uh, that has the the dark energy uh, dominating its evolution, as it seems to be in our universe now. So, um, so just to review, you know, dark matter is something that makes uh, dense in space that curves space time around it. Dark energy is something that sort of stretches space out. So, dark matter, dark energy, dark matter, dark energy. They kind of work in opposite ways um, on space. So. But, you know, together, they make up most of the universe. So when we look at what the universe is made of, um, somewhere around 26, 27% of the universe is dark matter. The remaining, of, you know, about 68% of the universe is dark energy. And then the leftovers, <laughs> just this little 5% slice that I've labeled atoms, is everything we've ever seen or touched or interacted with, everything visible, all the visible matter in the universe is in that little slice as is the entire standard model of particle physics. So if we wanna understand um, what how physics really works, how particle physics really works, um, then we have to understand the rest of this pie chart. And if we, if we understand the rest of this pie chart, then we also understand the origin and fate of the universe to a much better degree than we do now. So that's the kind of motivation be behind uh, thinking about these, these questions. Um, and I will stop there, thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Mack. We have many questions, so uh, we'll get okay. as many as we can in before nine o'clock. And if you do want to get your question in, uh, hit the Q&A button down at the bottom, folks. And uh, again, we'll get as many in as we can. Uh, I'm going to abuse my privilege as host, though, and ask one of my own. So okay. um, we're near Cape Canaveral out here, and recently we saw the Euclid Space mm. Telescope launch. Um, they're billing that as okay. probing the mysteries of the dark universe. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. How is that going to help uh, the search for dark, dark matter and dark energy? Yeah, so so Euclid is um, is a great experience, is a great uh, instrument. It's going to be uh, surveying uh, galaxies. It's going to it's got uh, infrared capabilities, and so it's going to look at um, a whole huge number of galaxies across a large swath of the sky. And the way that that and it's going to look back in time. So it's going to be mapping out um, quite a lot of cosmic history by looking at distant galaxies. Um, across the sky at, at a lot of different epochs um, by being able to see quite far. And the way that that helps is that um, if you're studying dark energy, for instance, instance there have not been very many ways to study dark energy. Um, it seems to act kind of the same in all directions. It's invisible and it's, it's kind of evenly distributed across the cosmos. Um, but what it does is it affects the expansion history of the universe. And so if you can study uh, all of these different galaxies, you can, you can get a better view of the expansion history of the universe. The other thing you can study is the growth history of structure. So like um, how galaxies and clusters of galaxies grew over time. And that's again, something where if you can see a lot of galaxies over a large um, swath of the universe over a long time, uh, then you can get some information about that growth history of, of, of the universe. And so that's the dark energy segment is basically learning about the history of um, galaxies and their, and their um, you know, motions and growth of the universe. And then in terms of dark matter, it's also going to be mapping out where all the matter is, um, like in terms of where the, the galaxies and clusters of galaxies are. And that's just going to tell us a lot about the distribution of matter in the universe, which also gives us some interesting information about dark matter. It's going to probably, I think it's going to do like gravitational lensing studies and things like that as well. Um, so it's going to help map out um, the dark matter and, uh, and the sort of structure in general. So that's going to kind of look at both these dark matter and dark energy sides of things. Well, we'll see what it finds. It's got to be neighbors yeah. with the uh, JWST, right? It's out at the uh, mm -hmm. point. So that's pretty cool too. Cool. And uh, next question. So is it better, more accurate to call it um, dark gravity rather than dark matter? Like, can we be sure it's really matter or could it be some mysterious well, force of gravity from another dimension? I mean, it acts just like matter, you know? Um, it, it acts like, it acts exactly like matter that just doesn't do electromagnetism. Um, and, and at some point, you know, it's, it's something that has gravity and it, it behaves, um, you know, it evolves like matter in the way that we, we understand matter to behave. Um, the only difference between dark matter and regular matter is that dark matter doesn't do electromagnetism, but, um, 
in, in every other way, it acts exactly like matter. You can call it dark gravity, but the um, but it do, it would have to like gravity has to have a source, and that source acts just like matter. <laughs> and 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 when I say it acts like matter, I, I mean things like you know it collects and clumps like matter does. Um, you know it it create it if you if you make a simulation of the growth of uh, structure in the universe by just taking a bunch of, of particles in your computer and give them gravity, you know, give them masses. Um, and then you let them evolve over time as little particles of matter. If you just don't give them pressure, they make the same distribution of matter that dark matter in our universe seems to have. Um, so it's, um, you know, you can call it invisible matter. I think that's kind of a better name for it than dark matter. Um, but yeah, sometimes people call it dark gravity, but it's not, um, I don't think that's necessarily a more general description because of the way that it that it uh, it does seem to be something that acts very much like matter. But you know, I mean, that is it is still possible that that you know whatever kinds of modifications you want to do to gravity could all be conspiring in this very complicated way to act exactly like a collisionless particle. Um, but I think that um, I think that at this point the the sort of easier uh, sort of more obvious conclusion is that it is a, a collisionless particle just like a neutrino but more massive basically Occam's razor to the rescue cool yeah all right John Pinto asks um do we know if dark matter is spherical around a galaxy or can it be elliptical or other non-spherical shapes like a donut or something yeah no that's a great question um it seems to be spherical ish for the most part uh, there are um there are studies that look for what we call triaxiality of the um of the dark matter halo so triaxial meaning it has three axes that are not necessarily the same right um and i think that uh there are there are situations where you do see some elongation or whatever generally because um dark matter um uh, arranges itself in sort of clumps and filaments. Um, so you make this kind of spider web like structure uh, in the uh, in the cosmos uh, where there's clumps of dark matter and then they're connected by filaments and then there are these giant voids. Um, and so depending on where that clump of dark matter is, it could be sort of elongated if it's kind of connected to a filament. And we have seen um, through through very careful gravitational lensing studies, we have we have found the existence of filaments of dark matter, so we know that sometimes it does kind of stretch between uh, clumps, uh, between clusters. So so that is definitely a thing it can do. Um, in general, uh, the halos that are around sort of isolated galaxies appear to be pretty close to spherical, but um, uh, but there can be there can be some variation there, and it's hard to get an exact uh, shape because the, generally the way that we we determine the shape is by looking at how the distant uh, galaxy images are distorted um, uh, sort of en masse uh, from, um, if you have a whole lot of background galaxies, you can see small distortions and that kind of gives you a, a sort of high resolution picture of this of this uh, clump of matter through the gravitational lensing, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's not always easy to get perfect uh, data on that. Cool. And I think you inadvertently answered another question here that asks, uh, mm -hmm. what role does dark matter play in the creation of the cosmic web? So you were kind of speaking right. to that through the filaments that- it, uh... Yeah, it is the cosmic web. Yeah. I mean, so if you if you look at a visualization, and unfortunately, I don't have one in this, in this version of this talk, um, but if you look at a visualization of kind of how galaxies are distributed across the cosmos, they are distributed on this on this web, but they're kind of in the in the most dense parts of the web, and the whole web is dark matter. Um, so you you have you create this web of of um, matter with dark matter, and then you kind of sprinkle the galaxies on the most dense parts, and that's that's what our universe looks like. Very cool. All right, Wesley Clem asks: Could the source of dark energy be an enormous amount of dark matter beyond the visible universe, causing galaxies to be falling toward it? kind of like an Oort cloud around our solar system. Yeah, so so this has been, this is something that has been studied. Um, the problem with this is that um, we would have to be the center of the universe um, and it would have to be like a really giant bubble. And 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 also like, it's, it's not just that the, um, like it's not just that the very edges of our observable universe is where stuff is moving away, things are moving away from each other, things are moving away from us. Um, there really does just seem to be more space as time goes on. And, and that's a, a trend that's continued throughout the history of the universe. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't work. Uh, if, if you go into the details, it, it doesn't work for it to be things falling towards something else. It really has, 
it really makes much more sense if if what's happening is that um, things are moving away from each other um, and there's just more space. Um, but uh, but yeah, people occasionally have tried to kind of arrange things uh, with like voids and stuff to 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 make it um, to make it the you know sort of a, attraction rather than expansion and and um, typically the 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 math just like the geometry just doesn't quite work for that. But it's a good question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, Frank Fortinese uh, asks, um, who are some other leading experts in this field and their theories? <laughs> like, uh, who are who are the rock stars besides you? Uh, I mean, it's um, it's just it's such a big it's such a big field right now. There are so many people um doing great stuff and uh and if i if i tried to name them i would just name my friends <laughs> so i think um i think I, I probably i shouldn't do that but um but i will name a couple of other people who've written books about uh, dark matter that that might be of interest so um uh one colleague of mine um uh chanda prescott weinstein wrote a part a, a book called um uh the disordered cosmos that talks a lot about dark matter and and about her um her experiences in academia and her research. Um, and then there's also a book um, by uh, colleague uh, Katie Fries, or Catherine Fries, who wrote a book uh, about dark matter. It's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, something like um, Three Fifths Dark Matter, Three Fifths Dark Matter, something something like that. Um, um, but Catherine Fries is her, is her name. Uh, and she, she has a book recently about dark matter. Um, so, so you can check those those books out if you're interested in in learning more. Um, and both of those talk uh, a lot about kind of um, you know about kind of the work that's being done. Although um, Chanda Prescott Brent Weinstein's book is a bit more um, sort of particle theory, um, but Katie Fries's book has a lot about sort of the history of of um, of uh, discovery and dark matter. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, so there's there's a few books out there. Um, there are a lot of people working in the field, but. Uh, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to sort of name specific people because uh, I, I that would be I wouldn't be able to be unbiased there. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, uh, Richard Wright asks. I was intrigued by the earlier animation about stars' velocities around the center of the galaxy and how they don't mm. behave like they should, orbiting the gravity source yeah. at the center. In these simulations, yeah. do they also integrate the gravity effect by all the other stars in the galaxy, like a giant n body problem? Yeah, yeah. So um, that cartoon. Let me get back to that cartoon here. Um, so yeah, so you can include the the gravity of all those little stars. It will make very little difference um, in these simulations. Um, in in general, in in a real galaxy. I mean, if you look at a um, a galaxy like this, uh, you know the the center is so much brighter. There's so many more stars in the center um, that the, the this the mass of the stars sort of in the outer arms is really insignificant but also even if you zoom out quite a lot like way past the edge of the light of the um you know the, the edge of where you know things are really bright so in this case you know you go out you know sort of right to the edges of the frame you still see the same effect and and there are very few other stars around there um so so it really it really does act like there's there's matter continuously um, all the way to beyond the edge of the light of the of the galaxy and and you know in these in these plots you can also kind of see that where these lines correspond to um the you know how far out you can observe the the stars or the gas um and there doesn't seem to be any drop off you know as you get as you get to the those edges of that so it really does indicate that is whatever it is it keeps going um and it doesn't um it doesn't depend on on the sort of density of the stars that are there cool thank you and uh, i think we have time for one more uh so okay. john pinto asks uh where do the spiral arms of the galaxy come from does dark matter play a role in that that's a great question um so as far as we know it doesn't play a role in that so the the spiral arms are um come from like the density waves of um the as the matter so the matter collects in a in this in a disk uh, due to due to um, like interactions, like so, so you start with a cloud of gas, and then those those gas particles are kind of all moving around, and they they bounce bounce off of each other, and and um, and lose sort of the all the components of angular momentum that are not in the sort of overall rotation, and then you get a disk that's just the rotation of the kind of net angular momentum of the of the initial cloud, and then there's um, like there's like density waves within that disk. And so those kind of travel through and create these waves 
um, these uh, spiral arms, uh, they're kind of density waves kind of moving around in the circle. It's kind of hard to explain, um, but uh, but they come from the um, the initial sort of organization of the gas in that in that disk. The dark matter doesn't seem to have um, there doesn't seem to be significantly more dark matter in the disk part of the galaxy than than in the rest. I mean, if you look at the kind of this diagram, I mean, this is just a cartoon, but but the the dark matter seems to be pretty you know uniformly um, distributed sort of in the three in the sort of three dimensions, and then it, it it reduces in its density as you go out from the center, but it doesn't seem to be stronger, you know, there doesn't seem to be a concentration in the disk of the galaxy. There have been searches for that, for a dark disk, um, for as an explanation for a number of different things. And and there hasn't been any detection of a dark disk. So it seems to be that the, the dark matter doesn't really, isn't really strongly affected by the disk, doesn't really gather in the disk. It's it's really much more spherically uh, distributed than the, than the regular matter is. So it doesn't seem to play a, a role in the um, in the the um, formation of the spiral arms, as far as we know. Excellent, thank you. All right, I'll let you get back to your evening here. Uh, if people want to follow okay. you, I think it's uh, at Astro Katie, right? It's Astro Katie on Twitter, and then um, on Instagram, it's um, Astro Katie Mac because somebody took the Astro Katie name on Instagram. But um, uh, but uh, everything is on my website at uh, astrokatie.com. So if you want to look there. Awesome. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. It was a great yeah, talk. Thanks and for I having lot, me. So. Yeah. Oh, thank great. You. Thanks. Cool. All right. Great. See you. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, up next, I think uh, John Pinto, you wanted to say a few words about membership benefits, right? Yes. Um, just for the uh, folks who are not CFIS members, um, let me just turn my video on for a second here. So I'm not invisible. Um, you may be wondering why would you want to join to CFIS if you can just listen to these wonderful programs that we put on uh, for the public. And the reason is, is there's much more to CFIS than just our, our monthly program. Um, we have, as uh, Trisha mentioned, we have a lot of uh, in-person only, you know, CFIS member only uh, dark sky observing events. Uh, you get to be a member of the Astronomical League, so you have access to their observing programs where you can get certificates, uh, you know, learning about various uh, topics in astronomy. You have access to our loaner scope program, which is fantastic. We have a lot of different scopes and, and eyepieces and astrophotography equipment we can loan out to you. Um, just getting to know other CFIS members. I mean, we, we're just really a great group of people um, with a lot of diverse interests. Um, it, there's just way too many reasons not to join uh, CFIS that, you know, I can't even, uh, just personally, I've been in astronomy clubs almost all my life, and this is probably one of the better clubs I've ever, I've ever been on, and I just welcome, uh, welcome you to join us. Well said, absolutely. Thank you, John, and uh, with that, I'll let everyone get back to their summer. Uh, you won't see me again until September 16th for our next in-person meeting at the Planetarium, but there will be get-togethers between now and then, so keep an eye on Groups.io for outreach events and uh, upcoming classes and whatnot. So in the meantime, uh, hope for clear skies and I'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. We'll have this up on YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow if you want to rewatch it or show your friends. So thanks a lot.